Welcome to Distrust and Disparities, Dismantling Black Health Disparities podcast. We examine health disparities that disproportionately affect Black women and Black families. In addition, we amplify organizations and individuals working to dismantle racist health practices and systems to improve health outcomes for marginalized communities. I'm your host, Jasmine Moore, a registered nurse, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Camille White. This nurse was an outstanding student of her time, an expert and tender practitioner, an exemplary citizen, and an untiring worker in both local and national organizations. In this episode, we discuss Mary Eliza Mahoney, the first African-American to earn a professional nursing license. And we highlight the National Black Nurses Association and Black Nurses Rock, two organizations dedicated to supporting and uplifting Black people in the field of nursing. Welcome back, Distrust and Disparity podcast listeners. We're excited to be back and it's the month of March. March is also Women's History Month. So this month we wanted to make sure we celebrated some trailblazers in the healthcare field. Before we jump into our main topic, we're talking about the first Black professional nurse, Mary Eliza Mahoney. I just wanted to give you guys some current statistics about the nursing field. According to a 2020 survey conducted by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing and the Forum of State Nursing Workforce Centers, nurses from minority backgrounds represent 19.4% of the registered nurses. And I'll give you the specific breakdown. 80.6% is white Caucasian, 6.7% is African Americans, 7.2% Asian, 0.5% American Indian, Alaskan Native, 0.4% Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, 2.1% they claim two or more races, and approximately 5.6% report their ethnicity as Hispanic. And like I said, 6.7 is African-American registered nurses. Research shows that patients benefit from a workforce that represents them. And racial minority patients in the hospital, their percentage is about 32%. So it's not adding up. So we have like 19% of minority nurses, but the patient population is about 32% minority, so it doesn't accurately reflect. There are tons of studies saying that patients do better and are more willing to listen to healthcare advice from someone who reflects their values and their sense of culture. Nurses compromise the largest proportion of the entire healthcare workforce, and they are also the most trusted. On January 25th, 2021, leading nursing organizations launched the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. The commission examines the issue of racism within nursing nationwide, focusing on the impact on nurses, patients, communities, and healthcare systems to motivate all nurses to confront individual and systemic racism. The commission is led by the American Nurses Association, the National Black Nurses Association, the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nurse Associations, and the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. The commission is working to address unfair structural and systemic practices, organizations, healthcare systems, and individuals to ensure that The nursing profession exemplifies inclusivity, diversity, and equity. And I just want to highlight a study that the commission conducted that they released in 2022. So 
the study, they surveyed over 5,000 nurses. Overall, it shows that racism is a substantial problem within the profession. And some of the key findings that I wanted to point out, it says nearly half of nurses agree there is a lot of racism in nursing. 63% of nurses surveyed say that they have personally experienced an act of racism in the workplace. About 66% of the transgressors have been a peer. 63% have been patients. 60% have been a manager or supervisor. And one specific quote that they highlight states, I have been called the N-word by multiple patients on multiple occasions. I have been called colored by a nursing manager. Okay. Oh, nothing like going to work and being called the N word or such an outdated word as colored. You might as well just say Negro at that point. Like, how can you be so out of touch? Yeah. Or a lot of patients, if they have like dementia Mm. or they start to get old, they start to think they back in time and the days Mm. and they just be saying some crazy things. I remember it was this nurse practitioner. She addressed me as girl and I, Oh, and she, Mm. I've worked with her multiple times. So, and she knew my name and I also wear a badge, but to say, girl, can you do this? I mean, I just, I think I turned around and said, girl, (laughs) I can give a look like, (laughs) Excuse, Excuse you? you? Yes. And, you know, uh, said, you know, my name is Jasmine. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. you, <laughs> when you're looking for me, you know, you say that. But I was yeah. like, it's crazy. Yeah. People get a little too comfortable, relaxed, or they think they could say anything. Or, unfortunately, people, some of them are ignorant and they've never been confronted by the words that come out of their mouth because some people are just like, I don't have the energy to go into it to explain to you why, why not only this is racist, but it's also deeply unprofessional. Like Mm -hmm. why would you like try to call out another employee at work, your coworker as a child name? Like, yeah. Just thinking back, I also had this one patient, he was a prisoner and he was yelling the N word at the top of his lungs. Like, oh, like everybody could hear it. And it's like somebody saying the N word, it's like, okay. And you're just like, okay, I see what kind of shift it is. But literally mm-hmm. yelling it, and I have to like give medication, <sighs> give antibiotics. And it was just like, I just felt like so shaken up, even though he's a prisoner and he's chained, but he's like literally yelling the N word. And it was just like so frustrating and so <sighs> infuriating. I was working with like another nurse and I just had to tell her like, oh my gosh, I was like, I really, I can't, if they need anything else, like, can you please go in there? You know, she was the only one to, you know, approach me and be like, are you okay? Like other, you know, nurses, they saw what was, you could hear what was going on and what was being yelled. Nobody said anything. And also at the time, I didn't feel like if I was to go to tell my manager or somebody else, like I didn't think, you know, I would feel supported or, you know, what else could they do? What else could be done? I mean, luckily the guards there, they were like, yo, she trying to help you. You really, you need to cut that out because she don't have to help you. I'm like, I do have to help him. But, you know, they were like, you know, the guards were black as well. They was like, man, this is ridiculous. But that situation, like, I just, you know how you just shaking? It's just like, it's just crazy. And it's just like, that. and that was at the beginning of my shift. It was just like, oh, man, that was rough. That was just, mm. that was one of those stories where you kind of like, you bury in the back of your mind just so you can like push through and just continue. But it's just like, oh. I guess, like, the only thing for me would be, like, someone give the sign off to be like, let's sedate this man because clearly he don't know how to act. It's just so unfortunate that, like, you would ever have to 
deal with a situation like that when you're literally like showing up for work and you're there to provide medical care for someone and they are just screaming such a derogatory slur at you like it ain't right and people don't appreciate and understand all that nurses have to deal with and I think they take nurses severely for granted in our society and it it just shouldn't happen Mm -hmm. yeah that moment was uh just it was crazy Mm. but yeah just thinking back like yeah he should they possibly sedate him or they were just trying to get him out as quick as possible but it's like you know I'm the one that has to go into the room and deal with the patient Mm -hmm. you know give him all the medications you know make sure that I've done everything for him to be discharged and the last the thing I wanted to point out, it says that over half of the nurses say racism in the workplace has impacted their professional well-being. And this one quote says, I have felt as if there is no way I would advance my career at some facilities due to my race. This has caused stress and anxiety and some depression. And also, oh, I, I want to point out this other percentage It says 50% of nurses said they have challenged racism in the workplace, but more than half said their efforts resulted in no change. And this quote says, speaking up takes courage. I have been ostracized for my advocacy and passed over for promotions. So even if you call out racist behavior or biased practices, it's not, you know, you're not taken seriously. Nothing is done about it. And then you're kind of looked at as the black sheep for calling it out and you're passed over for promotions. It's just disheartening and discouraging that this is what's going on. This survey took place in 2022. Yeah. And it really is because that happens so often in so many industries, career fields where You speak up and you point out something that, you know, there are literally laws against it. And because racism is such a systemic problem, nothing is done. You know, you go Mm -hmm. to HR, your supervisor, all the people that you're supposed to go to and tell them, hey, this is what's happening to me. I'm not okay. This isn't right. And then maybe they have you fill out some paperwork And you're thinking, okay, maybe the process has started and they'll actually look into this and actually something will happen. But unfortunately, a lot of times nothing does because they would have to admit as on an organizational level, they have a problem. I'm sure a lot of these incidences, they're not, you know, outliers. They're not one offs. It's something that happens quite regularly And instead of going, we actually want to change, they'll I'm sure they'll have some little Black History Month little spotlight posts, whatever, but you're not really trying to change. It's all performative, unfortunately. And then that's when you have people, let alone the stress of nursing, the stress of especially being in nursing during a pandemic where you have burnout from just the job itself. The fact that you're bringing and have to deal with racism, the fact that you have to deal with racism and that comes into it, like, that's what people are leaving. It's just like, no, I don't, I don't want to sign up for this. This is, this is nothing that anyone should have to deal with. Yeah. And I'm curious about what the commission, they have the survey results. What are they going to do about the results and how people feel? Like, what's the next step? How can we change it? And is one thing for, you know, to encourage Black students to become nurses, but once they get into the field and they start to encounter racism and challenges or they notice that they're being skipped over for promotions because less than 6% of African-American nurses are in executive leadership positions, what are you going to do to change this, to make it more equitable at all Mm -hmm. levels from being able to enter nursing programs once you graduate being able to get jobs at hospitals because a lot of times some of these hospitals it's about who you know and things like that and then if you want to advance your career what opportunities are there and 
I just wanted to plug that our friend Nurse Keith, who hosts the Nurse Keith show, is a podcast. He did a two part episode where he interviewed some of the board members from the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. And I would recommend listening to those two episodes to learn additional information about what the commission is doing. And additionally, you can check out our interview with Nurse Keith that was released last month in February, the end of February. And we discuss why we started the podcast and what we want listeners to take away from each episode. So make sure you check out those episodes and subscribe to the Nurse Keith show. Just wanted to plug that in. Let's transition into our main story where we discuss the first Black professional nurse, Mary Eliza Mahoney. Have you checked out our website? There you can find all of our episodes and show notes. You can even listen directly on the site and catch up on any previous episode you may have missed. You can read our bios and see what we're up to. Also, we made it even easier to contact us. Just fill out the form on our homepage and click submit. We invite you to recommend guests and topics we should feature. So what are you waiting for? Go check us out at distrustanddisparities.com. We're going to start with just, you know, the background of Mary Eliza Mahoney. She was born in the spring of 1845 in Boston, Massachusetts. And Mary was the oldest of three children of Charles and May Jane Mahoney, who were believed to have been enslaved in North Carolina before being freed. Mary was educated at Phillips School in Boston which after 1855 became one of the first integrated schools in the country. So Mary knew from a young age that she wanted to be a nurse. Of course, you know, Black women, Black people now, and especially in the 19th century, face systemic barriers to formal training and career opportunities as licensed nurses. Nursing schools in particular in the South, they rejected applications immediately from African-American women. But further north, the opportunity was still severely limited. It was a greater chance at acceptance into training and graduate programs. In the South, you know, no way in the world, but you had Mm -hmm. slightly better odds in the North. So it's just like, you know, slim pickings, you, you taking the best of the worst in this situation. So in Mary's teens, she began working at the New England Hospital for Women and Children. And this hospital was dedicated to providing health care only to women and their children. And it was also unique in the fact that it had an all-woman staff of physicians, which I'm just like, does anything like that exist today? Because that kind of sounds very awesome. Just right. Like we need to (laughs) revisit this idea. Mm Because I mean, yes, this. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make sure we pointed that out. All women staff of physicians. I like that. um, Again, like we say, it's important to see yourself. Like the fact Mm -hmm. that you have a whole hospital that has all women. And then their goal was like, we will only serve women and their kids. Mm -hmm. I'm sure health outcomes improved there significantly compared to other places where you're dealing with a man who may not respect women and may not want to listen to them. The New England Hospital for Women and Children was definitely trendsetter and also ahead of their time in a lot of things. And we'll point out about how they were the first professional nursing program. So on top of just Working there in her teens, Mary continued working at the hospital for 15 years. During that time, she had a variety of roles, including a janitor, a cook, and a washerwoman. And she often spent up to about 16 hours a day, seven days a week, ironing, scrubbing, and cleaning at the hospital. So that was... 16 hours a day. That's... That's double what most people do in terms of full-time work, eight hours a day. And it was seven days a week. 
Mary had like no time for herself. Like you she know. she was yeah, you barely getting any sleep and then waking up and doing it all over again every yeah. single day. But despite this work schedule, they point out she went to church. She also in her free her spare time, whatever spare time she had, she enjoyed reading and just like educating herself. So despite working these long, hard hours, she still found time to like better herself. So that's truly amazing. Yeah, it really is. And I'm sure part of that, like feeding into herself, then aided her when she eventually had the opportunity to work as a nurse's aide. And that, of course, enabled her to learn a great deal about the nursing profession. So like Jasmine mentioned, the New England Hospital for Women and Children, they operated one of the first nursing schools in the United States. And in 1878, at the age of 33, Mary was admitted to the hospital's professional graduate school for nursing. And so about 40 candidates applied for the program, but only nine were admitted. It's crazy. That is, because yeah. imagine yeah. being a black woman in this mm-hmm. program in 1878. <laughs> yeah. And like we pointed out, Mary was very hardworking and very driven. A family friend is quoted as saying she cooked, washed, and scrubbed, and she got in. A woman doctor wanted her there. And that was the only influence she had. So one of the doctors at the hospital recognized her hard work in her bedside manner and pushed for her to get into the program. Once she was in the program, she had to work even harder to stay in the program because despite being one of the nine admitted, she was the only black nurse in the program. So I can imagine how hard that was and like the thing she encountered as well. So apparently Mary's guiding motto, especially while she was in the program was quote, work more and better the coming year than the previous year. So clearly Mary's just like all about mm-hmm. improvement, always yeah. improving yourself, learning so you can grow and become better. And the program, it was very intensive and it was a 16 month program. And it's very similar to how modern day nursing programs are set up. And I know Jasmine can completely speak to this, but students attended lectures and got hands on clinical experience in the hospital. And then the intensive program consisted of long days with a 5.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. shift, which required Mary to attend lectures and lessons to educate herself through instruction of doctors in the ward. Out of the nine students admitted to the program in 1878, only four completed it in 1879. Yeah, that program was intense. That 5.30 a.m. <laughs> to 9.30 p.m., that Ooh. is a long day. And like you said, nursing programs, it is no joke. Just the anxiety of getting into the program, because I believe I went to Delaware State is a historically black college and university. There were like over 200 pre-nursing students. And I believe there were only about 50 of the actual clinical spots to get into the program. And that was one of the largest class. So it's just like, you're slowly being weeded out and you really have to like focus because you're taking anatomy, chemistry, statistics, a lot of classes and you know your freshman year you want to enjoy and have fun but you also looming in the back of your mind it's like I need to you know keep my grades up so that I can get into the program you have to take like a pretest to get into the program and then once you're in the program just managing clinicals clinicals for like a full-time job where you're going to the hospital where you're rotating through different units such as maternity general medicine floors, surgical floors, the emergency department. A lot of times, like you said, on the unit, the typical shift is like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we had to be on the unit, I think, by like 6 so that we could be assigned to what nurse that we're working with. So it was 
it was a, a long day. It was almost like you had a job, but you weren't being paid. <laughs> and uh, then like you those... to, like, study. It yeah. was a lot. <laughs> it sounds like sort of a situation of, like, a free sort of internship. But, like, yeah, you were in school, but, like, you are doing work. Yes, you're yes. building and learning towards your degree so you can become a nurse. But that's intense yeah that's all i can say it is and then once you graduate you have your bsn in nursing but you still have to take what's called the nclex which is so that you could become the professional registered nurse so you also have to study and prepare for that so it's like you have this either four years or two years at your program and then you have to take this test so it's it's very nerve-wracking nursing programs are very vigorous and intense i commend all nurses who completed and go on and advance their career because it is a lot. And for Mary to complete one of the first programs and to be one of four that completed it, that is an amazing accomplishment. And Mary, she would make history becoming the first African-American in the U.S. to earn a professional nursing license. And you know what? Looking back, I don't think I learned about this in school. Which is like, I don't I feel think like, so. At yeah. an HBCU, I, I honestly <laughs> don't think. <laughs> at an HBCU in the nursing program, you didn't learn about right. the first, <laughs> the first African-American to ever become a professional nurse which right. again it's just like there's so many things that I think there's just in general there is so much to learn and know but also that that can easily be just put in there quickly to be like hey mm-hmm. did you all know that in 1879 the first african-american became a nurse in this country so yeah. you to know be a part that, of all nursing education and yes. courses yes it should be in there it mm-hmm. really should you know what make a mental note maybe down the line we got to advocate for that make sure that's in nursing textbooks i'm gonna put yes. a pen in it <laughs> yes they can have a picture of her and have a at least a whole page if not two dedicated to mary mahoney and talking about her journey to becoming a nurse, and then once she was a nurse, which we'll get into now, her nursing career after she made such a huge accomplishment. Because racism, (laughs) Uh, she already had to deal with that going into her career field and working at the hospital and even applying to programs. But it's a huge impact. We talk about it all the time on this podcast. And we wouldn't even need to have this podcast if it wasn't for that to talk about the obstacles that many African-Americans and other people of color face in this country. So despite finishing such a rigorous nursing program and basically graduating top of her class, because again, we're saying out of how many was it? Out of the 40, then then we're nine (laughs) and then we're four who actually completed it. So that that's top of your class. Yep. Mary could not get a job as a public nurse. She faced an overwhelming amount of discrimination and she couldn't get a job at the hospital that she had worked at for, you know, 15 years. <laughs> like, how does that make sense? Y'all done seen how hard she worked. She done worked for y'all for 15 years and then went and got herself a nursing degree and was like, hey, what's up, you know? I'm qualified to do this, you know, other job now. And they were like, nah, we're good. Makes no sense. But luckily, Mm -hmm. instead of giving up, Mary went into private nursing. So her patients were mostly from wealthy white families who lived up and down the East Coast and primarily in New Jersey is where she worked. It's important to note that during the early years of her employment, African-American nurses were often treated as if they were household servants rather than professionals. Mm -hmm. So as a result, Mary emphasized her preference to eat dinner alone in the kitchen, distancing herself from eating with the existing household help to further dismiss the relation between the professions. 
because of that difficult decision that she made to sort of separate herself, her professionalism helped to raise the status and standards of all nurses, especially minorities. Because at that time, nurses, the career is still new and blossoming. And especially for minorities going in as a private nurse, they're thinking you're a servant or you're a help or you're the maid. But Mary's like, no, I'm here to provide medical care and attention. That's what I'm here for. And I know it had to be hard because probably the other people in the household that look like you, they're maids or they're servants or, you know, cleaning staff. And, you know, you would like to be around like your peers, but you're establishing like, I'm here for medical purposes. I have earned this degree and this professional accolades. So I have to carry myself in that way. Mary worked very hard in her role as a private nurse and her reputation began to precede her. She was known for her efficiency, patience, and caring bedside manner. And she was also known for her skills and preparedness. So as her reputation quickly spread, she re- received private duty nursing requests from patients in states in the North and as far away as North Carolina. And one patient is even quoted as saying in a 1954 journal article, I owe my life to that dear soul. She was very hardworking, professional, coming to the job and providing quality medical care. And She's working all the way in New Jersey, and it spread down to North Carolina. Patients were requesting her to come and take care of them. That's amazing, especially for a Black nurse. Mary knew what she was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. Clearly. Someone right. saying, I owe my life to her. I was just like, okay. Mm-hmm. Despite not being able to work as a public nurse, Mary continued to advocate to make the profession more accessible and help to open the door for future generations of Black nurses. In 1896, she joined the Nurses Associated Alumni of the United States and Canada, and they would later become the American Nurses Association, ANA. This association consisted mainly of white members, which were not always welcoming to Black nurses. And originally, they did not even accept Black nurses into the organization. Mary was one of the first Black nurses to integrate this nursing association. And despite being a member, Mary decided... She needed to create a separate group to properly advocate for equal rights, specifically for Black nurses. In 1908, she co-founded the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, and the goal of the new organization was to achieve higher professional standards in the nursing field, to break down discriminatory practices facing Black nurses, and to develop leadership among Black nurses. In the following year, at the organization's first national convention, she gave the opening speech. At the convention, the organizers, they elected Mary to be the national chaplain, and they gave her a lifetime membership. And a few years later, at the 1934 conference, the organization stressed the fact that Black nurses still needed jobs, and they needed jobs without the pressures of racial bias. So we can see up until the 1930s, still, Black nurses are not getting access to the jobs. It's like they may be completing nursing programs, but they're not getting the jobs. The organization worked tirelessly to interpret the needs of Black nurses, and they led vigorous campaigns to end discrimination in the field. In 1951, the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses was completely integrated into the American Association of Nursing. After decades of being a private nurse, 
Mary became the director of the Howard Orphanage Asylum for Black Children in Kings Park, Long Island. And she served as the director from 1911 until 1912. It shows she was finally able to, this was her first professional nursing job, and she served as the director. And Mary served as a nurse for 40 years, and then she retired. And that's amazing. 40 yes. 40 years. years is a long time to yeah. And she started at 33. That's, so up until her 70s. Yeah, that's an amazing career. Even after her retirement, she continued to be a champion for not only Black nurses, but also for women's rights in general. After the 19th Amendment was ratified in August 1920, Mary was one of the first women to register to vote in Boston, and she was 76 at the time. Mary... She lived until she was 80, and she battled breast cancer for three years, and unfortunately, she died in 1926, and she is buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in Everett, Massachusetts. Mary Eliza Mahoney is recognized as a pioneering Black woman and also an advocate in the nursing field. She has many awards and recognition, and they include, in 1936, the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses founded the Mary Mahoney Award in honor of her achievements, and this award is given to nurses or groups of nurses who promote integration within their field, and this award continues to be awarded to this day by the American Nurses Association. Mahoney's grave in Everett, Massachusetts has become a memorial site. In 1973, Helen S. Miller, who was a winner of the Mahoney Award in 1968, she led a fundraising drive to erect a monument to Mahoney at her grave site. Additionally, Mary was inducted into the American Nurses Association Hall of Fame in 1976. She was also inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993. So Mary, she has received the recognition that she deserves. I still feel like more people need to know her story. So I'm glad we're covering Mary's story and the contribution that she has made to the nursing field. And I just want to, before we move on to our next segment, I just want to leave you guys with one quote. Mary Chire, a former professor of nursing at the Teachers College at Columbia University, she wrote of Mary Mahoney in 1954. She's quoted as saying, this nurse was an outstanding student of her time, an expert and tender practitioner an exemplary citizen, and an untiring worker in both local and national organizations. She was a sound builder for the future, a builder of foundations on which others to follow may safely depend. If you are enjoying this episode, you should consider buying us a coffee. Yes, a coffee. That small gesture will help us continue to create quality episodes and content. Click the Buy Me a Coffee link in the show notes or check out our website at distrustanddisparities.com. In our next segment, where we highlight organizations working to dismantle racial bias, racist healthcare practices, we want to touch on that the nursing field has a long way to become more diverse and inclusive. And as we pointed out earlier, the first separate Black Nursing Association was absorbed into the American Nurses Association, but we still need more Black and minority nurses in the field. We just wanted to share some Black nursing organizations that are continuing the effort that Mary started to address racial biases in the professional field. The organizations that we want to highlight are 
the National Black Nurses Association, NBNA for short, and Black Nurses Rock. The National Black Nurses Association was organized in 1971 under the leadership of Dr. Sams, former dean and professor of nursing at Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama. The National Black Nurses Association's mission is to represent and provide a forum for Black nurses to advocate for and implement strategies to ensure access to the highest quality of health care for persons of color. This organization is committed to excellence and education and conducts continuing education programs for nurses and allied health professionals throughout the year. The association provides annual scholarships for its members. Black Nurses Rock was founded in 2014 is an organization with a focus to foster a positive environment of professional growth and development. They provide support and mentorship to nurses in an effort to elevate our profession and improve our communities. Their mission statement says, to inspire and empower innovative leaders that will serve and educate vulnerable communities. And I remember in nursing school, I went to the National Black Nurses Association. It was a, I think it was called the Day on the Hill. They had a day at Capitol Hill where they advocate for various strategies to improve the health of Black communities. And it was just very inspiring to be around other Black nurses that are working to address racial biases and just improve the health of our communities. It was very uplifting just to see Black nurses in positions of power, speaking on the work that they're doing, just advocating for better outcomes. And both of these organizations have conferences that you can attend. If you have research that you're doing, you can apply to present your research. So I encourage you, if you're a Black nurse or a nursing student, encourage you to join the organizations. They have local chapters. And like I said, they have other events and conferences that you can participate in. Just a great community to be a part of, to learn and grow, and just to feel inspired and to know that you're not alone in your fight to push for change. You could be the only Black nurse on your unit, but meeting up, going to a conference can just renew your fight and spirit to make sure that you advocate for your patients and for your community. Additionally, if you don't identify as Black or you're not in the nursing profession, you can always donate to the two organizations. Also, you can follow them on their social media pages and also their websites and just share their posts and their information. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you would like to suggest a topic we should discuss or share your own personal story, email us at distrustanddisparities at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate, review, and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Distrust and Disparities and on Twitter at DistrustPod. Thank you.